an enormous pleasure for me to introduce to you the 162nd series of Royal Institution Christmas Lectures that have been given in this lecture theatre. And during this year, since the last series, we have, uh, in the Royal Institution, celebrated the 200th birthday of the what I believe, and many other people believe, to have been the greatest experimental scientist who ever lived, Michael Faraday. So I think it's uh, also worth saying this afternoon that not only was he a great scientist, uh, but he was also uh, the originator of these Christmas lectures, which he started in 1826, and which he himself gave no fewer than 19 times. And I thought I would read to you very quickly uh, what he said at the beginning of one of those series of lectures when he stood here and I believe it was in 1854 and uh, he said the following let us consider for a little while how wonderfully we stand upon the world here it is that we are born and bred and live and yet we view these things with an almost entire absence of wonder to ourselves respecting the way in which all this happens now that was the reason for the Christmas lectures in Faraday's mind. It was to awaken wonder. And we're going to take up that theme again this year because Dr. Richard Dawkins, the uh, reader in zoology from Oxford University, uh, is going to tell us how you and I stand upon this world and how that all comes to happen. Because he's going to explain to us uh, how living creatures many kinds of living creatures, including you and I, have evolved on the surface of the Earth. We are very happy once again at the Royal Institution to acknowledge the help that we have had in preparing these lectures uh, from Shell UK and Shell International, uh, who have given us valuable sponsorship. Uh, and I would also like to take the opportunity to say that we are organizing, again, a competition this year based on the content of the lectures. So if you would like to participate in the competition, you will find the address uh, to send your entries to uh, displayed at the end of the lecture. Now, uh, it only remains for me to introduce to you uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins, uh, who is going to give the 1991 Christmas lectures of the Royal Institution on waking up in the universe. Hello, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to begin by asking you to do something for me. Would you please put your hands to your head and very gently feel your own head? Now that might seem like a very easy thing to do, but I can assure you, okay, put them down now, I can assure you that a man-made instrument that did that would be a very, very difficult thing to make, it would be a very, very expensive thing to make. As your arms go up there, precision instruments in your muscles are monitoring the exact position of all your muscles. Thousands of sensory endings in your fingers are feeling the exact texture of your hair, the shape of your ears, the shape of your skull. Your brain is measuring the width of your skull with the greatest of precision. If a human factory were to manufacture an instrument, a robot arm capable of doing that, it would cost something in the region, I would think, of a hundred million pounds. Now think about what is between your hands when you do that, your brain. The brain is a kind of computer, but it's a computer such as no human factory has ever turned out. If we ever do succeed in making a computer with the performance of a human brain, 
I would guess that the research and development costs would be in the region of thousands of millions of pounds. Yet heads like yours and hands like yours are manufactured daily, millions of times over. A woman can do it with no research and only nine months development and only a little help from a friend. <laughs> Life makes the wonders of technology seem commonplace. So where does life come from? What is it? Why are we here? What are we for? What is the meaning of life? There's a conventional wisdom which says that science has nothing to say about such questions. Well, all I can say is that if science has nothing to say, it's certain that no other discipline can say anything at all. But in fact, of course, science has a great deal to say about such questions. And that's what these five lectures are going to be about. Life grows up in the universe by gradual degrees, evolution. And we grow up in our understanding of our origins and our meaning. Of all the world's societies, the majority have practiced some form of ancestor worship. This is a totem of one particular cult of ancestor worship. Now, I'm not going to encourage you to worship your ancestors. I'm not going to encourage you to worship anything. But it is true that ancestors hold the key to understanding the meaning of life. <coughs> now, you might think it's easy enough to be an ancestor. It's easy enough to reproduce, or relatively easy. But to become an ancestor, you've got to have descendants alive many generations hence. And that's more of a tall order. We can think about it by going back to one of the simplest sorts of animals, a bacterium, right back at the beginning of life. And think about how many bacteria there would be after, say, 50 generations of reproduction. And we're going to illustrate this by folding paper. Now, I wonder if I could have two volunteers to fold the paper, right there and, yes, there. Okay. Come down here, please, and take the paper from Bryson. Right, now, every time you fold the paper, that's going to represent one generation of reproduction. So we start with one bacterium. That's one thickness of paper. Now fold it. Yes, if you both go to the same end, it might be easier. Now we've got two. That's right. Please sit down there. That's right. Fold it. And then fold it across this way. Thank you. And just go on folding it until you've done it 50 times. <laughs> so what have we got to now? Four? Four bacteria? Right, eight. Sixteen. Thirty-two. Well, can't you do any more? Right, that's probably... All right, it looks though they're not going to make it. We're going to have to resort to mathematics to calculate um, how thick that paper would be. Okay, thank you very much. Do sit down. Okay. In every generation, of course, the thickness of the paper doubles. So we go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. We go on multiplying by 2 50 times. After we've multiplied by 2... 50 times, what have we got? We've got a very big number indeed. We've got, in fact, a thousand trillion, one with 15 noughts after it. The sheet of paper is a tenth of a millimeter thick. If you multiply that by a thousand trillion, you end up with, I've got it written down here, a hundred million kilometers. The thickness of the paper would take us out to the orbit of Mars. The number of bacteria after a mere 50 generations is that. But 50 generations is nothing to bacteria. They can get through 50 generations in a day. After about a week, bacteria, the number of bacteria would be more than a billion times the number of atoms in the known universe. 